be the third and the last of the three videos on slavery and i'm going to break it into two parts i'm talking about resistance to slavery and also the justification some of the weird apologies or explanations that southerners came up for with slavery before the civil war so the first is resistance uh and we don't hear much about this for logical reasons because southerners always wanted to promote the myth that slaves were very, very happy under slavery. In fact, you still see that occasionally in contemporary times. But slavery is a system that is involuntary servitude that depends upon force and violence to keep the system going. And the question, of course, is if you have absolutely power, no power, and you are considered a thing, not even a person, how do you resist? And under the slavery file, I am talking about uh, slides 29 to 35 at the end of slavery. There are two kinds of resistance. The first is passive resistance, which we are learning more about as time goes on. Um, this was resistance, basically, how do you resist your master without getting caught? And that was a tough job. Um, first of all, there were constant patrols in the neighborhood. Uh, you are basically sabotaging the system without getting punished, because if you were found guilty of something or caught doing something, the punishment was often very severe. So how do you do this? Anybody who has a crappy job at a crappy place, um, working at Walmart, uh, working, I used to work at Kmart for a while, uh, knows what I'm talking about. How do you pretend you're working without really working? You slow down, you work slower, and we've already talked about this. Slaves worked hard, but they worked less hard than they probably would have worked for themselves. Um, you could break or damage property like tools. You go out to the fields. Oh, look, master, I broke my hoe. I have to go all the way back and get another one, and that would kill an hour. Um, you could um, tangle up the harness on the horses. Uh, oftentimes uh, horses were injured or other livestock were injured. Can't work today. The horse is injured. I can't plow the field. You could damage property. You could play sick. We all know about this one. Um, you could spoil food if you were really pissed off at your master. Slave women, of course, had a pretty wide knowledge of herbal remedies from Africa, and poison was not unknown in the South. Uh, we have records in the books on at least 600 whites in the South who were poisoned that we know about, including whole families at times especially meat, especially the foods that were being prepared, because who did most of the cooking again? Um, the assumption was that, by whites, was that all African Americans would steal. Was this true? Absolutely not. Look at Thomas Jefferson. He had sent his slaves on messages with hundreds of dollars in their pocket to deliver to people. Um, but it was true in many cases. Uh, why? It's passive resistance. You're fighting back against a system in which you have no power. The other way you could resist is to run away. And this is a lot more common than we know about. We all know about the Underground Railway and Harriet Tubman, but there were thousands and thousands of attempts to run away from owners, even under the penalties, even with the slave patrols. Maybe, as far as we know, about 10% are successful. So if we have maybe 10,000 recorded runaways that made it, then we probably had at least 100,000 attempts. Almost all were male and single males because it's very difficult to try and run away when you've got little kids and a family. Many of them newly arrived from Africa particularly in the early years of, of slavery. Runaways were so common that printers in the South had standard images ready to use in ads for runaways. Not only did you have to, to run away from your area, you had to get not only north of the Ohio River where slavery was outlawed in the northern states, but you had to oftentimes get to Canada because you were not safe 
just in a northern state. Slave catchers had the legal right to come catch you and return you to your owner. There were also, in many places in the South, particularly swampy, um, uninhabitable areas like in South Carolina and Florida, uh, communities of what they called maroons, which were slaves, Native Americans, and mixed blood people who were pretty much left on their own. Nobody wanted to go in and drag them out of there. And oftentimes they would fight to the death rather than be retaken into slavery. So they're always in the South, uh, the, the threat of some type of a rebellion going on. Um, the other thing you could do, of course, is open revolt. This was not hidden. Um, it was more common than we think about. There are not so many recorded. Again, the last thing Southerners want to do is, is advertise this and make this well known, North and South. But revolts, in other words, uprising against slavery to gain freedom, were much more common in Spanish America and Latin and South America. Number one, because they had very large plantations with large numbers of slaves and many more adult male slaves. In America, most slaves lived in family groups on plantations. In the South, most were single males, and it was much easier for them to have an uprising. Um, there were every five or 10 years across the South, some type of revolt against slavery and a number of deaths as well. And this was again, not advertised. If you look at that chart, I don't expect you to memorize it. The only one that's that I think is crucial is the Nat Turner Rebellion, which is the last one out there, which is the one that most people know about. First rebellion that we have records are, take, just take a look at the date, is the early 1700s in New York City, which did have a lot of slaves because of the Dutch slave trade. It was unsuccessful, but the slaves involved were newly arrived from Africa and fought to the death rather than be returned to slavery. Stono Rebellion, 1739, there were at least 23 whites killed and up to 100 slaves. Most of these are failed uprisings. Why? Because the word was passed around and very often a slave would rat on the leaders. Why would a slave rat on his fellow slaves? Because the reward for ratting out a rebellion or any kind of resistance was immediate freedom. So there's a huge incentive to rat out your brothers. And once you were freed, you immediately had to leave the state for obvious reasons. Nat Turner is an interesting case and pretty indicative of a lot of the slave revolts. He was educated, he was literate, not educated, but literate. He was a preacher, a religious leader, and a community leader as well. And we don't know the whole story, but something happened along the way. Uh, maybe the master got worried about him. He was separated from his wife and sold to a different plantation and clearly had some grudges. So he begins to organize a revolt. And because he's literate, he tells the slaves on his new plantation, I'm going to make the sun disappear from the sky. And he did. Because he was literate, he knew there would be a solar eclipse coming and the other slaves didn't. And then he said, I will make the, the sun reappear in the sky. Once he did, slaves were pretty overwhelmed by his supernatural powers and he promised them that he could protect them against the whites if they rebelled. So one night, middle of the night, uh, this is every slave owner's nightmare. He rises up, he takes some tools from the barn and with a few companions, he slaughters in their beds, the men, women and children on that plantation. After that, they took the weapons in that plantation and they marched down the road into half a dozen other neighboring plantations, each time taking all the weapons on site and gathering slaves as they went. At the end, they had several hundred slaves marching down the road and the local militia was called out. They had a knockdown drag out battle for several days until they finally captured the leaders basically through overwhelming force on their side. Now Turner, was tried very quickly. He was hung along with the other leaders of the rebellion. And before he was hung in his trial, he quoted 
from the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence back to his jurors, but was hung, of course. Nobody knew in that area who was involved with the rebellion, who was not. Lots of hundreds, several hundred slaves were executed and paranoia in the South really, really increases after Nat Turner's rebellion because it is almost successful and it is every Southerner's nightmare that the slaves will rise up and slaughter us in our beds. Okay, the weirdest part of slavery, one of the weirdest parts I think is how Southerners dreamed up ideas to justify to support slavery as a good thing because there of course is absolutely nothing good about slavery slavery by definition is unchristian because in christianity all are equal in the eyes of christ and it is definitely undemocratic because all men are not born with life liberty and pursuit of happiness so they have to come up with some pretty strange arguments the interesting thing is, as time goes on, the arguments shift from slavery is a terrible thing, but we don't know what to do about it, which was Thomas Jefferson's dilemma, to slavery is a positive good and it's great for Africans. So how do you do this? The first thing they come up with, of course, is an argument that's used, been used for slavery for a long time, is that all great societies depended on slave labor. And this makes some logic. If you look at Greece, Rome, Egypt, China, all great civilizations had numbers of slaves. It's a good thing for the people in charge because it gives them a lot of time to create great things, to write great philosophical ideas, to have free time to do the great things to make a great civilization. Thomas Jefferson, for example, if he was plowing his own fields, would not have time to be a great thinker. Counterpoint to that, of course, is their own society, Northwestern Europe, was the dominant political and social power at the time. And in Northwestern Europe, there had been no slavery historical, historically. So even their own civilization, you can create a great civilization without slavery. They had done it themselves as well. The second argument is a biblical argument, and if you go back to the Bible, you can find, of course, everything in the Bible. The Old Testament talks about Noah and Noah's three sons, um, and of course we know the Bible is subject to interpretation. For one thing, it's been translated several times, and you can find anything if you look hard enough. Noah had three sons. After the ark landed, they scattered in different parts of the world, and the one that went to Africa in the Bible is called Ham. Ham is the Hebrew word for burned or dark. So you can see where I'm going with this. The son of Ham was Canaan, and Canaan, for as, as the story goes, I'm not a biblical scholar, uh, Canaan, went and looked upon his father naked at some point, which was evidently a terrible thing. And the Bible says, because of this, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be unto him. So the descendants of the burned or darked ones in Hebrew become African slaves very conveniently. Abraham also in the Bible has slaves. They are called bond servants, but they are called property as well and are hereditary. Abraham's wife, Sarah, is barren, if you know the biblical story. And Abraham, who wants a son, uh, gets, his, gets her servant pregnant, her servant Hagar. And Hagar has a son. And one day she takes the child, flees into the desert, where, and I'm quoting King James again, the angel of the Lord said unto her, return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. So slaves, you're not supposed to run away and you are su supposed to submit and obey your masters. The New Testament itself often talks about cheerful obedience being the will of God. And Paul himself says, obey your masters in all things. Now, of course, the biblical argument against this is if Adam created all men, then everybody is equal before God. 
And in Christianity, we're all supposed to have an equal access to salvation through Christ. The third point is the argument that slaves are natural slaves. Again, this is slide 29. Or if you want to call this the civilized, the savage argument. Europeans did not have a huge amount of contact with African civilizations. They stayed on the coast because they died of malaria. They went inland. What they were seeing of Africans were people who had been brought as slaves. They were nearly naked. They did not speak English. They were usually not Christians to start out with. They did not look like or act like Europeans. What did they know? What did Europeans know about African cultures? Practically nothing other than giving them guns and letting them subdue each other. Okay. Um, this is written about slaves again in the American South before the civil war in Africa, Africans lived in the most complete state of barbarism for 4,000 years. They had opportunities of becoming civilized and like the wild horses, they must be tamed and domesticated. So they were seeing people brought and to their eyes far inferior. And we were doing them a favor by basically bringing them into slavery. They also saw that Africans, and this is the true part of the story, had some resistance to some diseases, particularly malaria, which was true, actually. Sickle cell is an adaptation to malaria. Uh, they believed that Africans were built for manual labor. Look at Native Americans, they died off if you put them to work in the fields, but Africans seem to do just fine. Um, another argument they used for this was that free African Americans didn't succeed very well. Well, first of all, their job opportunities were extremely limited. They were forbidden from most occupations. Number two, in the 1840 census, an interesting thing happened. In the 1840 census, they found out that one of the categories that they were looking at in the census was basically the term, and they used the term insane. And they found out that almost no African-Americans in the South, less than 1% were insane, but 6% of free African-Americans in the North were under the category of insane. John Quincy Adams, bless his soul, said, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this. And he began to go in and check the records and see what was going on. And what he found was that it was a Southerner appointed by John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, the great apologist for slavery, who was in charge of that part of the census. So basically, they were cooking the books. Basically, that was fake news, if you want to put it that way. The counterpoint to this, of course, if slaves are naturally built for slavery, if we need to civilize the savages, what about Muslim enslavement of Christians that was going on pretty steadily? What about Egypt? They are Africans too. They clearly built a very superior civilization. And why do some free African Americans succeed Beautifully, I mentioned the African-American astronomer who lived in uh, Philadelphia that Jefferson was communicating with. You had Frederick Douglass, you had Sojourner Truth, you had very literate, very accomplished African-Americans when given the opportunity. But of course, they're not given many opportunities. The actual statistics, 10 million, 10 to 12 million slaves brought to the Americas North and South of those 10 to 12 million, in 1860, they had 6 million descendants. So slavery cl clearly isn't great for slaves if they are decreasing in numbers. Of the 2 million Europeans who came to North and South America as immigrants, 1860, they had 12 million descendants. So clearly freedom is a little more successful than slavery. The last one, uh, well, no, polygenesis is the last one, sorry. The uh, fourth one is, of course, an argument that Southerners use pretty regularly, that 
their version of slavery was better than what they called white slavery, northern slavery, where there were slaves in the north, but there were a lot of very poor factory workers. And by 1850, 1860, the conditions of working in factories were pretty grim. Once the Irish arrive, it's all downhill. You will get people who will work for basically bread and water. Southerners argued, and there's some, again, some truth to this, that their slaves had security, they were cared for from cradle to grave. They didn't have conflicts. They didn't have strikes. They weren't thrown in debtor's prison because they couldn't pay a bill. Um, that's all true. On the other hand, they're overlooking, of course, passive and active resistance and the rebellions. But there was some truth to the fact that people working in northern factories, in many, in many um, situations, were not working in a whole lot of conditions different than slavery. The counterpoint to this is we have estimated at least 100,000 slaves that tried to run away from slavery. As far as I know, on the records, we don't have a single case of a northern factory worker who ran away to a southern state because he thought slavery in the south was a whole lot better than working in a northern factory. The last and weirdest explanation was polygenesis. Poly means many, genesis means origins or genetic line. And this became the big ex explanation in the years before the Civil War. So you can see what's going on. The, the explanations are moving more and more to heredity rather than environment. This was the argument that Africans were genetically inferior. Monogenesis, which is what the Bible talks about. Uh, God created Adam, all men are descended from Adam. They had to come up with a different twist on this. In polygenesis, God made a number of creations. He created Asians, he created Native Americans, he created Africans separately before he created Adam so that these separate creations, these earlier creations, became separate species, kind of like monkeys. So they were not really men, they were a separate species. And if you look again at the Bible, going back to the Old Testament, uh, when God created the earth, he created the earth in seven days, and he created all the fish and the, the land animals and the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, et cetera, et cetera. And then he created Adam, took a rib from Adam's side and created Eve. Adam was created last. And in King James, it says that Adam was given dominion over all the other animals. So by this, of course, Caucasians, the last and direct descendants of Adam were given rule over all earlier creation. This is a pretty weird, strange logic, but they're coming up, they're coming up with strange reasons to, to explain slavery, to justify slavery. This is where you begin to get studies of the physical differences and people running around the South and plantations doing things like measuring slaves' heads and the shapes of slaves' head. And they found big surprise that African skulls were 10% smaller than European skulls. So of course their brains had to be much smaller. Of course, that's fake news. Number two, it works fine until you get to Albert Einstein who had a very small skull. So clearly this has nothing to do with it.